This is the 21st video in a class on single agent search. And in this video, we're going to be looking at the topic of multi-agent pathfinding. So multi-agent pathfinding is a problem that's been looked at for quite a number of years. It was called pebble motion on a graph when it was looked at from a more mathematical aspect. Uh, there, they looked at the problem and showed that there were polynomial time solutions uh, that were not, they're not necessarily going to be anywhere near optimal, but there were polynomial time solutions available for an abstract problem, thinking about moving pebbles on a graph. And this is a problem that was worked on then sort of more modern algorithms began in the mid 2000s, around 2005. And David Silver had a, a, a paper at the AID conference that looked at how this could be done uh, more efficiently. And then there was work starting soon after that that, uh, again, continued it, work, continued it. And what we've seen today is that there's been just an absolute explosion of work on multi-agent pathfinding. There's many, many different definitions of the problem that have been used, and there's many different applications. So as an example of this, Amazon warehouses, um, the, in an Amazon warehouse, there are storage bins. The storage bins are stored in the main warehouse portion. There are robots that basically pick up storage bins or shelves, storage shelves, and will bring the storage shelf to where pickers then pick the items that need to be packaged up, and then they take those shelves and put them back. And then you have many, many robots that are all moving these shelves at the same time. And this is a multi-agent pathfinding problem. So in the multi-agent pathfinding problem, you have a set of starts states, uh, a set of goal states. So we have, a, you know, S is going to be like S1, S2, S3, S of uh, N, if we have N agents. We're going to have a set of goal states, which again would be like G1, G2, G3, all the way to Gn. We have some constraints on here, like no two of the goal states are the same, typically, and no two of the start states are the same. And the goal is to find a path for each of the agents. So we have an agent at each of the start states, they have to get to each of the goals, and the agents are not allowed to be on the same uh, vertex in our graph at the same time, and they're not able to cross the same edge in opposite directions at the same time. There's quite a few variants of this problem. And so in some variants, for instance, you might have uh, arbitrary edges to the graph. And therefore, we also would say that if they're on two different edges, then they're not allowed to overlap. And uh, I should say, so this is MAPF is what this is called. And uh, so that'd be like MAPFR would be looking at moving around in a real valued space and, and having you know agents that have size associated with them. And there's other things like task assignment. So we have things that need to be done, but we could assign the robots in different ways. Anyway, there's many different variants of this. And when we think about automated vehicles today, there's obviously moving on a roadway would be a multi-agent pathfinding problem, but there's a lot of other more constrained environments. So thinking about moving airplanes on a runway, um, thinking about maybe a staging yard for trucks that are you know trying to pick up uh, so the trucks are picking up the different trailers and, you know, are going to be taking them around or um, uh, they might be moving them around or taking them out of the, tr of the truck yard. And so there's other constrained environments like this where these sorts of algorithms have a lot of applicability. And you could even be going into space like, you know, th thinking about uh, drones moving through a 3D space as well. So all of these would be instances of the multi-agent pathfinding problem where we're trying to find at least in the simplest version of the problem, what we're going to talk about today is how to get agents from the start to the goal without colliding with each other. And if we look at just on the surface of this problem, then we could think about, um, so the goal is to move all agents from S of I to, S, uh, to G of I without collisions. And you could say, well, this is just input. Like this on the face of it, it's just a, it's another simple problem. We've got a goal here. We know what the goal state is. We know what the start state is, right? So here's my start state. It's the configuration of all the agents. Here's my goal state, a configuration of all agents. And what are my actions? Well, it's to move the agents. And uh, we'll start out by looking at something simple like a four connected grid where they can just move in the four different directions. If we think about that problem, 
then we know what our successor problem is and we just might say, well, what's the problem? We can just apply A star to this problem. And so uh, approach number one might be uh, to use A star. And the problem with this is that A star is, can be used, in theory it would solve the problem, but it's actually very, very inefficient. And it's actually very inefficient in a very interesting way because we know A star is optimal in the number of expansions, but we don't know necessarily, in fact, we know that it's not necessarily optimal in generations. That is, it may generate um, many, many, many more states than it actually has to generate in practice to be able to solve a particular problem. So for instance, if we think about a normal problem with a normal set of agents, you know, we might say, well, it's the branching factors B. So, you know, we might think B to the D and where D is my solution depth, that's the size of my problem. Now here, very often, because we're thinking about agents that are embedded in the state space, then we might have a polynomial state space, but we could just ask what is the branching factor? And so let's think about if I have, um, so if I think about if I have a B actions or operations or operators, and so B operators in a four connected world would be for instance, to move up, down, left or right, or maybe even to also stay at the same location if I wanna wait so that other agents move around, that'd be a great option. So I might have like five operations here that I could have for a single agent. And let's just suppose that I have um, K agents. Then what we would see here is, well, the first agent has B operators. The second agent has B operators. The third agent has B, is, well, sorry. Um, yeah, there's K agents. So the third agent has B operators. And in general, then we're gonna get up to all K agents are going to have in the worst case, B different operations, which is going to give us B to the power of k operators in this joint problem. Okay, so the way we like to solve things with a star is we just have one joint problem. And if we do this, well, we've got k agents, all k agents have b operators. And so the just the branching factor is already going to be exponential, it's b to the k. That's just the branching factor. And then if we start thinking a depth on that, well, this is gonna be like B to the K to the power of some depth. And even if it's polynomial, you know, this is still gonna grow, it's still gonna grow very large very quickly. Okay, so generally speaking, this problem is too large to just throw A star at it and have it generate all the operators. And one of the things that makes this very inefficient is that um, most of these states have a very high F. So if you think about it, for every agent, there's maybe only one operation, one action, maybe two that are gonna move it towards the goal and are going to cause the heuristic to decrease. But you could have K agents here, right? If all K of my agents move in the wrong direction, then my F cost can actually go up by K each step. So typically we think, you know, the, the F cost maybe goes up by one, it goes down by one, it's gonna, you know, change very slowly. Um, but what we're gonna see here, when we have, when we have K agents, then there are gonna be some, oper some actions here where maybe every agent has their heuristics stay the same or go down. And so we see the F cost is uh, generally gonna stay the same. Uh, we have, it's, we're assuming a consistent heuristic, we say maybe the F cost will stay the same or maybe it'll just grow very slowly. But with all these combinations, there's many, many, many of these combinations where the agents are going in the wrong direction, exactly the opposite direction where they should go. And so then both the, the cost of an action and the heuristic both go up. And so for all of those actions, the F cost can get really high very quickly. And so we're gonna generate many, 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 many states that are not very interesting. And so that says right now that basically A star is, is it going to be a really bad move. Uh, or a really bad uh, algorithm to take. So um, A star is going to be, it's, it's just really weak. It's not gonna be able to solve many problems. And the reason why is because 
the uh, it's this combination of the number of operators that you have at each state and the fact that many of them have high F cost. And so um, that says that we should be wanting to do something that's a little bit better. Okay. And so we're going to leave A star. We'll just set it aside over here. There it is. It's a bad idea. We're not going to do it. Now, there's another thing that we could try doing here. And the second approach we're going to look at, which is going to be called EPEA star. And EPA star is uh, enhanced partial expansion A star. And what we see here is there's a base algorithm called partial expansion A star. This is originally designed for work in a domain that had a large branching factor and they were running out of memory. And uh, then there was a later version that was developed in the context of multi-agent pathfinding, which is an enhanced version that was saying, hey, there's, we, can, we can actually do some things that are quite a bit smarter than the original version of partial expansion A star. And so that's what I'm going to talk about here. Now, EPA star uses this idea of two things called a collapse macro and a restore macro. For people who are actually taking the class in person or we're doing it virtually, but we have some class meeting times, we actually did discuss these collapse and restore macros. And there is a position paper by Ariel Fellner that describes these as an abstract way of looking at many of the algorithms that were previously invented. Uh, but the idea here is basically a collapse macro says we want to remove a tree from memory or a subtree from memory. And what we're going to do is we're going to replace it with the minimum F cost in that tree. And the restore macro is going to uh, restore the tree up to the uh, minimum F cost. Or just to be clear here, uh, or uh, at least it's going to, we could, we could restore one, like we could restore a whole bunch of states at once. We could also restore incrementally a single state. Um, so we could also do a single state with, uh, but we're going to keep this F cost record. Okay. So the idea of a collapse macro is I say, look, I've done expanded some big giant tree and I need, it's taking up too much memory. And so I want to have a summary of what did I learn by searching down that tree. And the summary of that is basically what's the minimum F cost that was generated but not expanded. And what the restore is saying is, look, well, I have a tree that I've collapsed. And what I want to do is regenerate that tree. And a way I can regenerate that tree is I can go until I find a state with whatever that minimum F cost was. Or I can just say, I'm going to regenerate these particular states, you know, my particular children, and then I keep track for all of those, you know, somewhere below them, there is a state or the, in the subtree, there's going to be a state with some minimum cost F cost. And uh, we need to make sure we are at least going that far. And so uh, this is a way that we can keep track of information that we might have wanted to have uh, in part of our search. And you could even think of algorithms like IDA star. What is IDA star doing? Well, IDA star actually searches an entire tree and then collapses it. And, and right, it searches the tree. And when it's done, you're back to a single node. And what does it keep track of? Well, it keeps track of the minimum F cost that was not expanded. So this is what IDA star is doing. It's actually running an entire search and then doing a collapse macro on it to get back to the start. And then when I run the next iteration, what am I doing? Well, I'm searching up to that same minimum F cost. And that's what the restore is, is actually the next layer of IDA star. So IDA star looks this way. Um, A star, because we never do a collapse, doesn't look like this. But SMA star is a, a very early, or not a very early, but in the mid 90s, it was a memory bounded algorithm that was developed. And um, there are other algorithms that can be described in, in this framework. So EPEA star is a general thing that says, I have this ability we're going to trade on this ability to be doing collapse and restores. 
And so when we think of it this way, so this is just one of the many algorithms, but what we're going to do, given that we know that we can do this, so this is a general technique, what EPA star does, it says we're only going to generate, and this is the enhanced part of it, the enhanced says, hey, in many domains we can do this, we're only going to generate states at the current F cost. And then we're going to store the parent with the lowest ungenerated F cost. Okay. So what it's doing is it's saying, look, I expand a particular state. In particular, here, if we think about um, this case that we're looking at over here, we have B to the K possible operators. What we're going to do is we're going to say, look, uh, I've got, I don't know, I've got 10 agents or 50 agents, and I want the F cost to go up by two. And so I can then, it, it's actually very easy to do this in a four connected world. I want all combinations of actions where the F cost goes up exactly by two. And so what does this mean? Well, it means that every, let's say all agents except one follow the heuristic exactly, but one agent goes in the opposite direction of the heuristic. And so its F cost goes up by two. Uh, everybody else has the F cost stay the same. And so overall, the F cost goes up by two. So you could do that. You, there's basically combinatorially, you can exactly generate all the actions that have exactly the current F cost, where the current F cost is the F cost of the node. And as we generate uh, the children of a node, we're going to store the next ungenerated F cost. So we might say, okay, the current F cost is 10. We generate all the children with cost 10. And we say, well, our next cost is going to be 11. And then we'd say, hey, come back and generate all the states with cost 11. The successors cost 11. And only if we need to, will we come back and generate all those with cost 12 and then 13 and then so on. But the idea is then we'll store the parent in each step and say the parent goes back onto the open list and says, well, now I have ungenerated children with cost 15, with cost 16, with cost 17. But the idea here is we're only going to generate exactly the minimum, the current F cost, which is the minimum F cost that I want. So this is just like A star. Um, it's it's going to run normal like A star does with an open list and a closed list. When we expand states, you know, we're going to check if there's duplicates and everything else, except when we expand a state, instead of generating all of the children, we only generate those at the current F cost. Anything else we is basically collapsed into the parent and the parent is then stored back on the open list with the ungenerated F cost. And so what this does is it allows us to over, uh, avoid the exponential overhead of expanding uh, a set of states, a set of start states, right? If I take all my start states and expand them, I get an exponential number of successors, possible successor states. And here, now it could be polynomial, it could, in, in some cases, you might be able to create instances where this could be exponential, but the point would be is that there's going to we're going to have to look, if we're going to find an optimal solution, we have to look at everything with the minimum F cost. So we're going to generate those, which we have to look at, but we're not going to generate anything higher than that. And so EPA star, we can show that that's an effective algorithm, and it'll do the minimum number of node expansions, and um, given this exact same uh, information, but this can be uh, much more effective when we think about the, the pure joint space that's searched between the agents. Okay, and um, so this is EPA star, and EPA star is better than A star, but the problem is it is still sitting in this joint space, okay? And the joint space is still expensive. And so these really, I, I present these A star and EPA star as baseline algorithms to say, here's some things we can do. And there might, are some cases where maybe we want to use EPA star as a backup solver for maybe solving small instances or things like that. But in general, these algorithms are not able to um, handle everything that we need to handle. And um, so there's one other thing that we can do here, I'm just going to point out, is uh, what we call independence detection. So we might notice that we have a state space that we have a bunch of agents. So I'm going to draw this as a grid and uh, we'll get some different agents here. I'll do all the agents in the same color, 
but I could have like an agent down here and an agent here and an agent here and an agent here. And what we're wanting to see is we want to see these agents swap positions. So like this agent has to get here, they, these agents have to swap. And if I think about this problem as an entire joint state space, then I might think that if k here k is equal to four, b is equal to five, I might actually think that my branching factor, just of, of if I was using uh, a star here, um, what I'd be seeing is, well, I might see five to the power of four as my branching factor. But if I notice actually that my state space is independent, so that the agents on this side are totally independent, they're, and in this particular problem, they don't really overlap at all, so there's no overlap between those agents and these agents over here, then I really can treat this as two independent problems. So I can break this down as the joint combination of the agents on the left, which would be five squared of a branching factor and five squared on the right, and we'd be able to solve the problem and, and actually be able to solve it much more efficiently than thinking of it as a total joint problem space. And so this is getting, this is an idea that we can apply with any particular algorithm is we can always take a subset of agents, we solve them. In fact, we can always take all the agents and make them entirely independent. And we can solve each of the agents independently, and then we can check their solutions. And any agents where their solutions overlap with each other, then we merge them into a group and solve them together. But maybe there's another set of agents that uh, their, their, their solutions don't overlap at all, and uh, we can put them in another group and we can end up with a problem that's actually exponentially smaller because we're solving a problem with a, with a smaller set of agents. So this is um, independence detection. It's a nice idea. It can run with everything, but it doesn't actually, in the worst case, make the problem any easier. So that's a nice idea. Um, and what we're going to see is we can actually exploit something like that when we get to one of the baseline algorithms that's used very broadly. And um, so this is um, so this gives us basically an introduction to this problem, and then we want to look at what are uh, what are some algorithms that we can do, or what is what is an algorithm we can do that's better than that. Now I um, haven't said anything here about the complexity, so let me just say something really quickly here. So the complexity of multi-agent pathfinding in general is actually NP hard which means that you know, we don't know of any polynomial time solvers for these that are going to find optimal solutions. And so that just says it's, it's known to be a very hard problem, and there's a lot of different variants that have been analyzed, and there's a lot of work here. So I'm not going to really go into the complexity. There's, there's a number of papers that have been published that describe the complexity in, uh, in various terms. But we just know that this is even necessarily, like if we think about pathfinding or something else like this, um, that's actually a polynomial time problem, um, like a basic pathfinding problem. And so when I get into multi-agent pathfinding, we're really sitting on a, in a state space with really, really hard problems. Okay, so as I said, this is our baseline that we've looked at here. And what I'm gonna to describe today uh, is uh, one baseline algorithm and this baseline algorithm is one of the most popular algorithms that's used. And this was developed by Guni Sharon as part of his PhD thesis. And uh, it predated maybe this very recent explosion of work on multi-agent pathfinding. And so in many ways, it's a baseline that many, many approaches begin with. And this is called constraints-based search. There are dozens of papers that have been published that give um, dozens of enhancements for how to do CVS, how to do it suboptimally, how to do it more efficiently, how to add heuristics, how to add a lot of other things. We're going to stick with the base version here today. Really, we could teach a whole class just on what's been done in the space of multi-agent pathfinding, but we're going to, we're just going to look at the basics here. CBS, uh, so I'll write this here, CBS. And CBS is a, at the, at the high level, it's a fairly simple algorithm. It's gonna be split into two pieces. So this is a very different approach than thinking about A star, or the way that we normally think about A star in this problem. But we're actually gonna see that CBS is based on best first search. 
and it's also based on uh, performing individual searches for agents. So it has two pieces. It has a high-level search, and the high-level search is a constraint tree. This constraint tree is searched in a, uh, in a best first manner. And I'll describe what goes on there in just a second. And then it has a low level search, which is basically a star with constraints. It ends up you can use other algorithms besides a star so there's a variant of jump point search that could be used with this. We haven't talked about jump point search yet, but you could use jump point search to work with this. Uh, there's an algorithm called SIP, which is a very nice algorithm for searching in a space where we have time extents. So we think about like we have a set of locations, but we could sit in a location for a long time. Instead of representing every discrete time, we can, uh, we can represent ranges of times. So it could be using something like SIP at the low level, but again, at the highest level, what we're doing here is we're going to be doing a low-level search with something like A star with constraints. Okay, and so what we're going to do is I'll show you how we're going to put these things together, and um, and then we'll use those to build up the entire algorithm. So let's look at the constraint tree. Okay, the constraint tree is uh, is going to be searched with the best first search. where best is going to be F cost. And each node is a solution or a potential solution. It's going to contain a complete solution for all agents. Agents, get that clear. And um, But the caveat is that they may not be valid. So there's going to be a solution, but there may be collisions uh, along that solution path. And we so we're going to terminate when we find a, val a valid solution. OK, so what does a constraint tree do? At the very root of the tree, we're going to take every agent and we're going to actually use a low level solver. So this is here. I'll say something about that to des describe the constraint tree, but we're going to solve for every agent individually. So every agent has a solution. We put it together. We have a complete solution for all agents, but we don't know if that solution is valid. And we're going to check and we're going to say, is the solution for a set, the set of agents that are inside the root of the tree, is it valid? And if it is valid, then actually that's the best node according to F cost. So the F cost is the sum. Uh, and there's actually many different cost functions we can use here as well. So I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, some of the different cost functions we could use would be sum of costs, where we just say how much was the total distance moved by all agents or the total time required summed up over all agents. So it might be think about like how much gas do we use or uh, electric, if we're an electric car, like how, how much electricity do we use? where maybe we also, you know, we don't save electricity by uh, waiting at a stop sign or something like this, or maybe we do. So like we could use uh, many different costs there. Um, but the other thing we, that is often used is make span. And make span is where, where you look at the total time from the first agent starting to the last agent finishing. So here we're gonna look at sum of costs instead of make span, uh, although we can adapt this if we needed to. So the root here, we've got a solution for every agent. We add those all up. That tells us what the F cost is. And, and then we, if we've had a solution, obviously this would be the best node. We'd say that's the solution and we're done. If not, what we do in the high level constraint tree is we find, what we're gonna do is we're gonna find two agents that collide. And when we find two agents that collide, we're going to introduce a constraint. So let's suppose, okay, so this is the high level overview. Um, we're gonna suppose here at the high level that there's two agents, A1 and A2 collide at location L1, or just call, let's just call it L here. 
at time t1. Okay. So I've got agent 1, agent 2. They collide at some location L at time t1. And I just have to find any two agents that are colliding at that time. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my constraint tree and I'm going to introduce a new constraint here. And the constraint that we had introduced here is that here on the left-hand side, we're going to say, look, in any solution to this tree, um, because A1 and A2 are colliding here, either A1 can't be at this location or A2 can't be at this location. There's also the possibility that they both don't have to be, but we can get we can basically mutually disjunctively describe exactly the, all the possibilities. So either here we can say, look, either A1 has to avoid that collision and not be at, at location L at time T. Uh, let me just write this a little bit bigger. Sorry, a little bit farther away. So what a constraint, what does it look like? It's gonna say agent A1 cannot be at location L at time T1. And over here, we're gonna say, well, on this side, we're gonna say agent two cannot be at location L at time T1. Everybody else is perfectly fine. They can continue to do what they do. And if we introduce this constraint into the tree right here, then what we're going to do is we're going to, at this next node here, we're going to resolve. Who do we need to resolve? Well, we've introduced one more constraint here. So agent A1 is going to have to replan at the tree right here. And agent one is going to replan and find a path where it's subject to the constraint, they start with constraints, that it cannot be at location L at time T1. But it can do anything else that it wants. Okay. So we come to the root, we find a, we find a collision at location L at time T1 between agents A1 and A2, and we say there's either two possible ways to resolve this collision. Either A1 isn't going to be here, or A2 isn't going to be here. Uh, it's possible they both won't be there, and that would actually be, would be a possibility on both subtrees, but we allow that possibility, so either A1 or A2 won't be there. And now we're gonna say whoever we've constrained, so this is a constraint, now has to go down and use the low-level search to solve, find a new solution of minimum cost where they are no longer allowed to be at this location at this time. And it might be that they have, oh yes, I just break my ties in a different way. And when I do that, then I can avoid this location. And so we get a new solution for agent A1. Agent A1 goes and avoids that collision and, um, and then we're fine. But then maybe we're gonna find another collision between two other agents. So then we might come here and we say, well, here's two other agents. And here we have agents four is at location L2 at time T2, and agent five it also wanted to be at location two at time T2. And so we had to split the tree there. And, um, and maybe in resolving this, we also increase the cost. So like for instance, we come here, we're going to resolve for agent A1. Maybe the cost doesn't increase, but here, so if I just put a number here, maybe I'm gonna say this is cost 10. Maybe when I resolve for agent A4, then the cost here is gonna go up to 12, and maybe here the cost goes up to 12. But maybe there's another way we could solve this problem where we come here, and when I do this, I'm also able to find a, uh, maybe even to find a solution here of cost 11. Uh, it doesn't look like there'd be a solution because A4 and A5 were colliding here. Uh, obviously that you'd expect to find the same collision over here. But the idea is we're basically going to take, uh, we're going to find two agents that are colliding in our current solution. We're going to ask those agents to replan, and we're going to say either one has to replan or the other one has to replan. And then when we've done that replanning, we uh, put them back. You know, basically we've we've split that splitting the tree. And when we split the tree, then we're saying from this point down in the tree, agent A one is never allowed to be at lo this location at time T one. Um, and what you can see is if you think about any possible solution to this problem um, where agents are at locations, every agent will be at a given location at a given point in time. And so whenever I, I go down a branch, I'm, I'm, there's always going to be either on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, or maybe on both-hand sides, there will always be a, a, a leaf node where the optimal solution is still a solution that is allowed according to the current constraints 
So in this node, there's two set of constraints here that have been added. And you know, the deeper the tree gets, the more constraints that I get. But there's always gonna be a node where the optimal solution is admitted because we never add a constraint to more than one agent at once. And so, and we only add it at one location and one time at a time. So it's fairly straightforward to see here that we can just continue to build this tree. And as we continue to build this tree down, eventually we will find a optimal solution at the leaf of the tree. So uh, if we run CBS, if we have you using this constraint tree and using something like an A star solver that can search, given these constraints that exist here, we will eventually find an optimal solution. Uh, we won't necessarily be efficient when we do that, but we will find an optimal solution. And so there's a couple of things that we can do for efficiency. And um, well, there's quite a few things we can do. So, but let's, let's start with a simple thing. So the first thing we can think about is a conflict avoidance table. And this also called the cat. Um, this goes back to actually very early work. So very early work, as I mentioned earlier, was done by David Silver in 2005. And what he proposed is that you store a spatial table where if I have a particular agent, what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent this agent. So this is, uh, let me actually write, label this again. So this is time, and this is going to be like X and Y location. And what we're going to do is agents are going to move through space time, and they're actually going to reserve in space time in this table the locations which they intend to move through through space time. Okay. So I'm not showing the inside of this table, but we can see like this particular path is a path that is going diagonally up and then it's going over. So we're moving across just the x-axis and then we move on the y-axis. And it would give us this, uh, it would give us this path that moves through space time. And now what we can say is I could put these into a table. So the this is the idea, as I said, came from was what was used in David Silver's 2005 paper. If you try and do this, it's like quite a bit more complicated to do this when you have non-unit edge costs. But um, that was done in a 2006 paper. Um, but the idea here is we just have a big table that says where are the agents going to be. And in, in that work, what you're doing is at the basic level is you plan for the first agent. So it's called prioritized planning. You plan for the first agent, then you plan for the second agent, avoiding the first agent. You plan for the third agent, avoiding the first agent and the second agent. And basically, each new agent has to avoid the agents before. And for some types of state spaces, that can be solve really large problems and can be reasonably efficient but not all the problems uh, can be solved effectively that way. So conflict avoidance table says this, it says, as I plan, so as I plan for each of my agents, even at the root, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break ties. So I'm gonna put my paths into a conflict avoidance table. And when I break ties, I'm gonna break ties away from the conflict avoidance table. So the first way that this can be inefficient as a search here is that we, it may be that there are actually a set of paths for all the agents where there are no conflicts. So all agents can avoid all other agents without increasing cost uh, above their sort of baseline cost and we could find a solution. But what might happen in practice is of course that, you know, we just choose paths that happen to collide with each other. And so we have to do a lot of search to actually resolve those collisions. And so what the conflict avoidance table is saying, well, I might as well be aware of those. I'm not going to be allowed to increase my cost, but I'm at least going to be allowed to try and avoid the paths that have been planned so far, so that if there is a simple tie-breaking mechanism that will avoid all collisions, I'll be able to find that. And so that's what the conflict avoidance table does, and it basically says, look, not only do I have an A-star planner with constraints but I, that come from going down the tree here, but I also get constraints from like a conflict avoidance table that says, hey, try and avoid these states that are inside this table if you possibly can. But if you have to, if you have to uh, go through these states, you can because maybe the other agent can move out of the way. You know, we, we're not gonna force you to go around them yet until we, until we introduce a hard constraint inside this tree. 
So conflict avoidance table helps a lot in just in terms of reducing the overhead because the agents by default start out by trying to avoid each other instead of starting out trying to be completely um, naive of where the other agents are. But I want to show you just a second thing that can happen here. And then we'll probably wrap up with this or some other discussion and then wrap up is show you one more thing that can happen when we look at the uh, CBS, and particularly let's look at a worst case for CBS. And the idea would be something like this. So imagine that I have a square here. I'm gonna put start one for agent one here and start two for agent two here. And then I'm gonna put goal two for agent two here and goal one for agent one there. And um, let's just put some lines in here. Keep this relatively simple. Okay. And if we think about all possible ways, actually, and we can include in here, you know, the grid extends, but the, I've labeled in black sort of the problematic piece that's happening here. Okay. So if we think about the way that these agents can go. Um, agent S1 is going to have to go at some number of states to the right. It's going to have to go some number of states down and then some number of states across. And the agent agent S1 or going agent A1 going from S1 to G1 could do this in a number of different ways, right? It could go over here and then go down here and then go over here and then go down here, go over here and then go down there. Those would both be valid paths. Okay. But what we see happens in this case is now we have agent S2. Agent S2 has to also find a path. And let's just to make it clear, we'll put this in another color. Let's say agent S2 wants to take this path. And let's look at the time annotations on this. So uh, this is time zero, time one, time two, times three, times four, time four there. And if we annotate this other path, then this is time step one, time step two, time step three, and also time step four. And if I say, well, that's no problem, I could look at this other path. So this would be time step three, time step four. This is time step five. And if we go to this agent, we'd also see that it will be here at time step five. So what we see actually is inside this area right here, S1 getting to uh, goal one down here and S2 getting to goal two over here, no matter how they move through this region, they're always going to have a collision at some time. So it might be here at time four, it might be here at time five, it might be here at time one. But basically there's many, many different locations here. And if I'm going to run regular CBS with this region right here, I'm going to have to introduce a constraint. So just for this two agent problem, I'm going to have to introduce a constraint for every single location here to try and block all of these off. And notice for each of these locations, these the tree is growing exponentially. It has a branching factor of two. So I'm going to thinking about like some space right here. I'm going to say, well, S1 can't go here on the left hand side. S2 can't go here on the right hand side. So that's a split of the tree. So agent one or agent two. And I need one of these left, right, left, right, left, right. And so what you're going to see is the depth of the tree is the number of cells in here. So in this case, uh, it's 12 cells and the branching factor is two. So for a tree like this, we're going to have to introduce at least two to the 12, which is going to be 4,096 nodes inside a CVS tree in order to resolve this conflict right here, okay? So CBS is not good at finding large regions of conflict that require many, many, many constraints to increase the cost and to get up to the next value here. And so what you see, if we think about multi-agent pathfinding algorithms, that a lot of the approaches that have been added to enhance CBS are things that are trying to take advantage of other ways that we can calculate this. So this, and this is actually really interesting because if you think about A star, A star is, is driven by heuristics, by numerical heuristic values. And so those numerical heuristic values are used to, um, to you know, we, well, we explore everything with a particular cost and then we raise the cost. In this space, we're thinking about, we explore everything with a particular cost and I use constraints 
actually to, to, to increase the cost. So here I might need to add many constraints to increase the cost. Sometimes adding a heuristic is going to be more effective than adding constraints. So I might be able to uh, do a heuristic computation between S1 and S2 that says what their heuristic has to be. And by using that heuristic computation, I might be able to say, well, in this configuration, we know that their cost has to be higher. And I can just do this in one step. I know their cost has to be higher. And therefore, I don't actually have to add every single constraint that exists here. I just say the cost has to be higher. Uh, and so, so what we see in CBS, which is really interesting, is we start to see constraints and heuristics are mixing together. And that combination is something that maybe hasn't been very well explored. There's a lot of open research that could be done here. But, um, but the, the latest work that's being done inside the CBS algorithm is being done in the space of saying, let's look at how we can put together both our constraints and our heuristics, maybe from different sources, or how I can come up with reasoning that allows us to come up with all of these constraints at once instead of getting them one at a time. If I can get all of these constraints at once and there's analysis we can do that allows us to do that, then I'll be able to, well, I save an exponential amount in the tree, right? Because instead of going, you know, 12 constraints that I need to add, we maybe be able to do this just in one step. At the simplest, like in a four connected world, we could just say, you know, do I have this configuration where the start and the goal are crossing? But there's a lot of other things where this could happen. So for instance, we might have a corridor. And uh, if I have a corridor where I have an agent like S1 and uh, S2, and then let's just say goal one and goal two are here. And generally speaking, my state space is, let's just say it's closed off, except for a small region at the end here. And so what I could see here is the two agents are going to basically try to go through this, this corridor and they're going to find, they're going to spend a lot of time basically negotiating who gets to go through the corridor and who has to wait, you know, maybe here for the other agent to go through first. So a corridor like this is another example where CVS is going to be adding many, many constraints here. And there, we might be able to reason or we can reason actually. Uh, using a much more complicated method, but we can reason about the fact that they are going to collide here and add the constraints that are required to avoid this in as few constraints as possible. So that being said, CBS is still a very, very successful algorithm, and I want to point out why is it successful? What is particularly useful for this algorithm? And the point is that here, if I think about the searches that I do at any of the nodes, all of these searches are single agent A star searches with constraints. Single agent problems, if we think about being embedded like in a two dimensional space, that's going to be a two dimensional search. Uh, there's maybe a time component that's added to it uh, because of the constraints are time based, but this is going to be a very, very simple state space relative to the entire joint state space. And so what CVS has done this is managed entirely to decouple the search so that no agent has to think about the joint branching factor, right? Up here in A star, we were thinking about this joint branching factor. In the EPA star, we were still thinking about the joint branching factor. We were just using this notion to sort of reduce some of that overhead. Um, independence detection is trying to reduce, and independence de detection can be used with CBS. It's trying to reduce this joint space, but it can't eliminate it entirely. Like if it's able to do some of this uh, division here. But CBS entirely decouples the agents from the, uh, from the search that combines those agents. And the only place that they're considered is in this high level tree where we're adding constraints one at a time. And so that is a very, very powerful algorithm for the multi-agent pathfinding problem. And so um, it's very effective in practice. Um, just to wrap up, I would just say that um, there are other approaches that I could spend time on. So uh, other approaches like ICTS is probably uh, one of these that has been more popular looked at. ICTS is a different algorithm that's broken into a high level and a low level search. So it's also trying to decouple it. But the low level search is also using a, a joint space. There's also algorithms like M star. So M star is another algorithm that's trying to decouple the agents. And it's, here it's trying to decouple around the paths that the agents find. And so um, that uh, can be, uh, in certain 
instances that can be a little bit more productive or more productive. Um, there's also versions of CBS where, so a version called MACBS. MACBS is an algorithm where you say, look, you know, these two agents, they've been causing me a lot of, they've been having a lot of constraints. Maybe instead of continuing to try and solve them independently, we should merge them together. And so MACBS was the original solution to the problem of how do I get my agents to avoid collisions with each other? And so that can work, but not many people are using this. It's not clear if this is solved by the more advanced constraint techniques that people are using uh, now. The other thing is that there's actually a whole bunch of methods and I'm not going to, um, I'm not gonna be able to name all the different algorithms here, but there's a research group in Australia that's looking at um, things like, um, you can think about things like mixed integer programming or integer linear programming, but there's a set of, of um, solvers. Well, based on, it, there's a whole field actually on constraint search. So constraint programming is, uh, you know, there's, there's just tons and tons of work that's been done looking at constraint programming as a field. And there they've come up with very generic methods for reasoning about constraints and propagating constraints. And so there are many solvers there that are very generic, that it can handle sort of generic constraint problems. And they can avoid some problems like, for instance, in a constraint tree up here, I might find that there's a subtree here which is duplicated. And we end up, if we duplicate this tree, we do a lot of extra work here. So there are some general constraint techniques which can be leveraged to like looking at some subtree here to realize that this is a, a duplication of the problem that we've had somewhere else in the tree. We can either reuse that information that we've learned in the other part of the search, or we know that for instance, that there's not gonna be a feasible solution there. And so there is some work at looking at general uh, constraints, uh, constraint programming and related approaches to try to reason about the state space more effectively. And these can be very, very, very effective in practice. The problem is that very, very few people are um, experts in this area and able to use these approaches. And um, so, and then what we see is that there's sort of a race going back and forth between sort of CBS based methods and some of the constraint based methods where, you know, we can add different enhancements to them to try and improve the different approaches. So there's still a lot more work to be done in the multi-agent space, especially thinking about more generic constraint solvers and things like that. And particularly when we get into sort of meta problems of now, actually I have, you know, start and goal and I could have new tasks that come on or I could have new robots that come on or the robots could break down or the robots could just execute their plans more slowly. So we want to be able to do it more robustly. There's just dozens and dozens of variants on this problem that will are being solved and need to be solved to be able to take this into the real world. Um, so here I've just, really given a high level overview of how to get into this space, what's going on in this space. And um, given this really high level overview, then if you're interested, then you, hopefully you can now go and start looking at some of the other literature to get up to speed with the current state of the art. Um, but this is the multi-agent pathfinding problem, very, very interesting problem, and a lot of in very interesting work going on in this space.